Nicolo says, do you guys use referral partners? If you do, do you mind sharing any examples? Jake says, when you sell the outcome, how do you have the expectation for how long it'll take if it's not immediate? Joanna says, what is your best procedure to fire a difficult client? They always pay, but they're just high maintenance and too needy. What up? What up? What up? There we go. It's official. We're actually live. Can I just say that uh, at the time of recording this, yesterday was the Super Bowl. And uh, I really love you all motherfuckers because I, I have a box of stuff called Things That I Don't Control and a smaller box of stuff called Things I Do Control. And I always say I like to have big opinions about things I do control, my family, my business, my life, my clients, my own decisions, whether I exercise, whether I eat good. And then there's a bigger picture stuff, you know, sports, movies, wars going on, and all of those things. And I say I like to have smaller opinions about those things, and you guys already do that. Um, and, and the average unsuccessful person, by the way, has the opposite ratio. They have big opinions on, you know, goddamn fucking coach should have gone for it on fourth down and shit like that. And I'm not saying you can't have opinions about sports, but the reality is that the shit you control is the most important thing to be paying attention to and making decisions about. And you guys already do that. And it, it just really makes me love you guys and appreciate you even more. I was expecting my news feed to be like all talking about the, the, the sports ball. And it was very mild. It was very mild. Like... Just a couple of little kind of funny comments about Taylor Swift, and that was about it. So I, I, you guys are the best. You guys are the coolest. I appreciate it. Uh, quick announcement before we get rocking and rolling. Um, we are filling up for Mexico, but I still have a few spots, and I'm going to be throwing in some extra cool bonuses. I have some ideas in book, too. We've been able to put together little, like, $500 to $5,000 a month recurring revenue streams that are based on the idea of passive automated recurring income, and, and the big thing that, that for me is huge is there's nothing to deliver. There's no clients. There's no work to be done. It just sets, you set it up and it runs in the background and pays you recurring revenue. It's the ultimate hack to building like, you know, a lifestyle, but not having to like be all day drowning in clients and fulfillment. And we are going to be doing that first in person in Mexico. So if you guys want some details, hit me up because uh, once the spots are gone or gone, I like them small and intimate and just like, you know, really be able to taste it, touch it, rub shoulders with people. Um, that's the first thing. Um, second thing is obviously like the Wolfpack's getting like uh, cooler. I'm, I'm actually been working on simplifying and simplifying and simplifying it. So it's easier and easier and easier to pe for people to get big results. Obviously our, our biggest kind of case study is we, we've helped somebody go from about 100,000 a year to 600,000 a week, not per month, uh, per week. Um, and obviously I'm not saying those results are typical or that you will get those, but there's some big ideas inside of there that can potentially level you up, change your life. If you guys are interested, I put a link below for you. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can go to beyondagencyprofits.com. There's a link for the Wolfpack, check it out. Other than that, let's get into the good stuff, your questions, all you smart, good looking, attractive people. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, Frankie Finn proudly brings you our weekly Q&A. I watched too much wrestling as a kid, but I can't watch wrestling now. It's funny. I don't know if any of you guys are like that. So anyways, let's get into the questions. Nicolo says, do you guys use referral partners? If you do, do you mind sharing any examples? Yes. Referral partners actually have been the biggest secret to our growth over the last, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 years, whatever it's been. On more than one occasion, just having one of the right partner has exponentially blown our shit up. And you can do this on purpose. You can make this happen strategically, intentionally, and all those good things. And I'll tell you the secret to um, making referral partners share you is give them tools to refer you, content, books, offers, giveaways, things like that. Give them tools to make referring you easy. That's the first part. And then the second part is understand that the biggest thing they have to lose is their reputation. Um, and so instead of saying like, give me all your clients, you say like, hey, <coughs> you give them, let, just give me one person for 30 days and let me show you I can, I can help them kind of thing. And, and they're more than likely willing to just like kind of feel you out a little bit. 
And to give you an example, um, I can give you two quick examples off the top of my head. Our first agency, uh, we did plastic surgery SEO. It blew up when a big web designer who had thousands and thousands or hundreds and hundreds of clients, I should say, he probably designed about 250 to 300 websites a year. About half of those people did uh, wanted SEO. He did not offer that. And so he was looking for a white label partner, tried us out for a little bit. We gave him some tools to make his job easier, like brought us like over a hundred clients, just one partner and then we ended up adding a few other partners along the way but we really only had like kind of like three clients even though um you know those three clients came with you know 150 clients of their own um so that's an example of like one referral partner blowing your shit up another one uh in the personal injury space i got connected with one of the industry association leaders invited me to speak on his stage his stage led to other stage then i got invited to the top masterminds and then like the shit just blew up in many many ways that's the power of a good referral partner um so um the key the key with like the key with getting referral partners by the way is is contributing to them knowing that they have all the clients and business you ever want and and you do that by helping them with content you help them out with you know the things as it relates to what you do and then you give them tools to be able to refer you uh, jake says in the comments my can can you drop me the details for that in the dm my question for today is uh you want to hire out your weaknesses but at what point do you just say i need to be choosing a completely different business model or niche um that that's a deep question jake um so obviously like uh the the best kind of partnerships in business work when people are doing things you hate so like for me a lot of the button pushing i fucking have like a major psychotic hatred so i hire a lot of people for that having said that um there definitely are limits on things that are created just purely from the business model and i'll tell you um Almost always, what I think is the biggest limiting factor in most people's business models is twofold. One is they don't get paid a percentage of the upside, and this is how easy it is to get paid a percentage of the upside. Meaning, like, say you help a client make $3 million, well, if you're charging them a thousand bucks a month for ads or 3,000 a month or 5,000 or whatever, you're actually getting a shitty end of the deal if you help to make 3 million. So just say like, hey, when this, if, if this is successful, I would like X percentage of that, are you open to that? And almost always they say, yeah, like if they win, they want you to win. That's the first thing. And then the uh, the second thing is, there are a lot of what's taught in our space, which in my mind are middle class values, which is simply trading time for money. Like if you think about poor people make their money this way, they, they, they work for a low hourly wage. Middle class people work for usually a salary and benefits and like some kind of opportunity to climb that corporate ladder and like opportunities for advancement within the company. And rich people own and control assets that make money. And I think the way most people run an agency, they're like the basic retainer for, hey, we'll run some lead generation stuff for you. It's really middle class values in disguise. And so it's it's like, it's a, it's a way to have a hundred bosses instead of one. But uh, the, one of the biggest things that investors do is they always look for, how can I invest a little bit of time, money, and energy to maximize upside? I'm gonna be going over way deeper into this in book two, but I think there are better models that build on the skill set of the agency to create passive automated recurring income, things that run in the background. I can't reveal too much because I'm still in the writing phase of it, but, um, but I believe that like, uh, if you take the skill set that you learn in that business model and just apply it a different way, uh, you, you can exponentially like get there faster by, make, by simply using the skill set to acquire assets and control assets and have assets be driving your income instead of you trading a service and having to answer to clients and have meetings. Not that I'm against those things, but I think they're, they're sophisticated forms of middle class values. And if you have, if you bring middle class values, you're gonna get middle class results. So like, what do what do most middle class people work for? Anywhere from like 60 grand to like, you know, like maybe 250 at the really high side, and most of them like probably 150. So like 60 thousand to 150, and spending a lot of fucking time grinding away doing that, and in traffic and alarm clocks and having to be answerable in meetings. That's the upside for most people in their model. So I, I can't fully answer that question my man because i'm actually writing the answer to that now but uh, I, I will make sure you get an advanced copy before it's live so that you can see some of that stuff uh before everyone else because i think chances are you can probably up level your income just by like tweaking your business model ever so slightly uh benjamin says um 
Does anyone have some writing tips or examples for su superior webinar ad cap copy formats, triggers? I'll give you guys a, a much simplified version of writing really good copy, okay? And, and I struggled with this for a lot of years. And a lot of times people say, I write really bitchin' copy. And I don't think that's true, actually. Um, I think I just know how to make good offers. Um, but having said that, um, if you want to write great copy, I want you to combine two ideas, okay? The first idea is that, and I did a free training for this. You guys can find it on our YouTube channel. It's called The Unfair Sales Advantage. So if you go into YouTube and type, Beyond Agency Profits, Unfair Sales Advantage. You'll find that training. And that first big idea is, do not write a word of copy. Your job is to parrot, not to write. What a parrot does is you say, Brah, it hurts when I touch my arm. And then the parrot goes, Brah, it hurts when I touch my arm, right? So your job is to get your client's words and to simply feed it back to them. So if you're trying to, um, you know, like learn how uh, what affects dentists. Don't try and write brilliant copy. Listen to what dentists say and feed it back to them. I actually just had uh, a client in the restoration space uh, that I'm expecting to pay their invoice like uh, this this morning and get started with us. Um, and one of the things they said is, "Oh my God, your copy spoke to me." I'm like, I didn't even write a fucking word of it. <laughs> I wrote the last sentence, right? Because I just parroted back with other restoration people. And ideally, I look for the things that get upvoted where a lot of people say, yeah, that's me right there in that situation. And so the first idea to write great copy is to parrot. The second idea is actually right here. I call it the finger pointer. And what you want to do is point to specific things. And I say the word specific because this is the mistake people make is they're too general. Specific things that they are doing now to try and generate results in their business that they frankly don't fucking like. And I'll tell you, almost always um, there's a form of like begging for referrals and feeling like they have no control over the business model and doing very old school things and and feeling like they get fucked by SEO providers and pay-per-click and all those things. But uh, ask them like, what do you do now? And then write down those things. And if you combine those two big ideas of like, feed them their own words back to them and point to things they are doing now, your copy will hit its mark in terms of like actually getting them to sell because you'll speak to, and this, this took me a lot of years. This is a writer downer, by the way. If you understand this, you'll make a lot more money. They are buying their way out of their current problems more than they are buying their way into your solution and any sort of benefits it creates. Let me say that again. They're buying their way out of their problems and only like 25% of it is buying the solution. And what most people talk about is their vehicle for success and how awesome the more customers and more sales and more leads are gonna be after. And in reality, they skip over the thing that matters to them most is I'm so sick of doing. So I'll give you a real life example so we don't talk about this in an abstract way. In the restoration space, I found out a lot of people get all their business from plumbers because plumbers fix a leak and then they say, hey, like, hey, we fixed the leak, but there's water damage everywhere. We don't do water damage repair. I can recommend you a company. Would you like me to make an introduction? Then they say, yeah. But the thing is, uh, most of those restoration companies, they pay plumbers for those referrals. So they, they feel like those plumbers are kind of prostitutes and there's for sale to the highest bidder and there's no loyalty. And what happens is they end up with a business they don't control because a plumber, if you're paying the plumber 300 bucks and they get 400 tomorrow, that plumber's a goner. And so they feel like they're kissing ass to plumbers for a business they have no control over. So rather than talk about how awesome my SEO is and all oh, how fucking amazing the rankings are and the more leads and the more sales and all those things, I speak to, are you sick and tired of kissing ass to plumbers? And almost always that's the thing they're buying their way out of. And I'm like, hey, if you use this internet system, you can be way less dependent on the plumbers, right? Like if you get your rankings, so, but they're buying their way out of what they're sick and tired of now. So find those things. And like I said, the, the free training is called the unfair sales advantage. It's on our YouTube channel. You guys watch it because it will make you money. A lot of it actually. Um, but just follow it, parrot their words back to them and find specific things they're doing now. Combine those two ideas and you will write 
sizzling copy to almost any market. I can do this in almost any market because I just find their own words and then look at what they're trying to do now to get results. And then I feed it back to them and they're like, whoa, it's like you know me, but I'm literally just parroting back what they already said. So if you understand that, you'll be a way better copywriter. And this applies, by the way, you asked for webinars. Um, the only difference between that and an ad and a sales page is, I, is the call to action at the end where I say, if you want the answer, sign up for my webinar over here where you'll learn A, B, and C, right? So, but focus on, on what they're getting out of, not what they're getting into, and your copy will be like exponentially stronger. And, and also, I don't know if you guys have heard this before, but um, um, great copy is emotional, and there's nothing more emotional than somebody talking about all the things you're doing that you fucking hate doing, right? Like, for a lot of you guys, I do this in the agency space, you guys have seen this, where I talk about how miserable it is, like, prospecting one-to-one -one and chasing people in their inbox and harassing them. That's all me, like, parroting your own words back and pointing to the things you're doing now that you fucking hate doing. Um, so, like, that that's how, like, you move the needle. Um, so I hope that's helpful. I hope I, I simplified copywriting 101 for you guys in that one. Ty says, we've been using phone setters for over a year. In our, in our industry, though, we can't really do warm transfers, so we just book scheduled calls. I'm moving into another vertical, though, where warm transfers will be great. I had one question that I think was alluded to, but I don't remember if it being answered. What do you do when the client doesn't answer the warm transfer? Specifically, uh, how do you uh, best script it during the sales and onboarding process to help them know results are limited by their ability to pick up the phone? physically what do you do keep the prospect on hold keep trying leave a voicemail and now it's up to the client to call the prospect back other we are going to check ty on that scenario the other box real fucking hard and this is this is my personal opinion so don't like take any of this as gospel but this is a universal problem in our industry where a lot of people we clients tell us they need more new leads they need no new more or more new opportunities and then you run facebook ads or you do seo or you do pay-per-click or you you run some youtube ads or you put up content whatever it is you do then all of a sudden they get those opportunities and um they still don't fucking answer the phone and close them anyway, right? Like, and it, it's, it, you bang your head against the wall. I actually can remember, just, just to relate, I was doing a pay for performance model and I, I, we generated what we were pretty sure was a million dollar roofing lead for like a giant factory. And I remember to the guy like, hey, did you go give the quote? And he was like, oh shit, man, I got drunk last night. And, uh, you know, me and Teddy and the boys, we had a few too many. I'm a little hungover this morning, but don't you worry. I'm going to call them back later today. Well, you know, you take a day and a half to, to call somebody back. They, they, you, they end up going with someone else and finding someone else. And that's exactly what happened. So I'll tell you what I think the answer is. Take it out of your client's hands entirely. Now we have a, a, a bonus you guys can find on our website. Uh, for, for those of you guys who are using Go High Level, but you can do this without Go High Level if you want. And this th this was actually developed by Lana, who's like a, a super genius in her, in her own right. But she, she was doing this for yoga and fitness studios. And what happened is their business model is <clears throat> to get people to come in and try it with a free class. And then when they like the free class, upsell them the membership. But there were two problems in that. One is the client was not picking up the phone to even like schedule the free fucking membership or the free class. And then secondly, they had no sales skills. And so the conversation we had is, why do we need the client to pick up the phone at all? Why can't we just put a scheduling app right on the damn website, let the client pick their own free class and set up a bunch of automated reminders so they actually show up and then set a trigger so that after they go into their free class, it immediately starts upselling them <coughs> the offer of come get a membership and therefore it is not dependent on the yoga studio owner to answer the phone or to be able to sell at all and we'll just use the resources they have and we call this our phoneless booking funnel and i would suggest instead of trying to cover up the client's shittiness with warm at or warm transfers and things and i'm not against using those i'll tell you in most markets people would rather just be able to book their own shit than, ha than have to call and talk to somebody and schedule it and all that so if you can make it automated and you can make the upsell process automated, you basically have a license to print money because you don't depend on clients. Because most clients, by the way, especially local businesses, which so many of you guys work with, this might be a little di different for e-commerce or online businesses, but uh, online like coaches and stuff like that. But for local businesses, they're usually not so bad 
once somebody is face to face with them, their shit and everything that leads up to that. They don't know how to answer the phone. They don't know what to say on a website. They don't know how to answer a call. But when they're actually face to face and they're talking about plumbing or a roof or those things, or they're a dentist looking in your teeth, they, they actually know how to do those things. So my suggestion is take it out of their hands entirely and experiment with that. For those of you guys who are interested in the phoneless booking funnel, if you don't already have Go High Level, um, we got a little bonus package if, if you decide to get it through our link. And for those of you guys who do, send me a little message and uh, I potentially may uh, share that with you guys depending on the old situation. Um, this is from Jean John. I, I'm going to go with Jean, although I like the French pronunciation. Jean. So we're going to try. Um, um, this is one of those ones. I get one of these like every damn week. And I want, I, I want to help you guys through these challenges because I understand... You know, one of the things is there's so many people cold DMing that it's all become noise and it becomes harder and harder to stand out, to get responses, to get people to like actually just pay attention and fucking buy your shit. Um, so he says, man, I'm having a hell of a time getting people to not say no thanks when reaching out on LinkedIn. So annoying. I recently started some of your messaging for cold outreach, Frankie, hoping it works. Below is what I've been sending realtors after I asked them if it's cool if we can share what I have with them. We call it the Area Authority Blueprint for Realtors on LinkedIn. The high-level rundown looks like this. First off, we optimize your LinkedIn profile to make sure it highlights your expertise and area to focus on so you stand out to potential clients. Then we zero in on the right locations, ensuring we're targeting the people most likely to need your services. Last week, we kick off message campaigns to these targeted prospects to showcase your services and to potential partnerships uh, opportunities in your area. The blueprint isn't just about visibility and expanding your network. It's about positioning you as the top real estate authority in your area and turning your new connections into meaningful client relationships. You can learn more about it here if you want to discuss more schedule of time. All right, my man, I'm going to give you the classic story of the hammer or the plane ride because your, your shit is ripe with it right now. And this is for those of you guys who've never heard that metaphor. What's up, my dude? I got to ask you, do I say it jean like blue jeans or Jean like a Frenchman? Either way, um, you're a cool dude. So the first thing about the hammer in the plane ride is, okay, so if you think about uh, weight loss, I'm going to give you three examples of this because hopefully it'll clear it up for you guys. If you think about weight loss, um, like... Weight loss has been sold the same way for a long time. Like you show a before picture of somebody who's like overweight, unhappy with their body. Then you show an after of them in shape. And in the middle is most of the fucking work. The middle involves sometimes like kettlebells and exercise and broccoli shakes and shit like that. But the worst thing you can do to sell weight loss is to sell all the shit in the middle, right? Like if I had a weight loss offer that says, come to Frankie Finn's house and we're going to... We're gonna do kettlebells, we're gonna drink broccoli shakes, I'm gonna beat your ass into a fucking bloody sweaty pulp. You're not gonna sell a lot of weight loss, right? Like it's the before and after states that they're most interested. Before because it's a relatable problem and after because that's like the, the future they wanna create for themselves. So <coughs> I'll use another metaphor, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use, uh, that's the first one. Second one, um, I call it the plane ride, but like anybody who gets on a plane is trying to get somewhere. Like, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm looking for flights, like, uh, I don't usually, I'm not one of those guys, like, I don't fly first class. I'm just, like, in the back with all, all the, the craziness. And I just want to get to where I'm going, fastest, cheapest, like, least amount of fucking detours and shit like that. So um, I'm sure most of you guys are like that, but I'm not buying the airline because I love the fucking airline. Um, for the most part, like most people who like, if you imagine buying a plane ride, they're they're buying like the fact that I'm sick of the office, I'm sick of the meetings, I'm sick of the politics, I'm sick of the alarm clock, I'm sick of driving in traffic, and man, I would just love to go to the beach and have palm trees and coconuts, and so the, and and you know see the bikini girls and the palm trees and the sunshine and the great weather and all of that, and so the worst thing you can do if you're an airline is sell the journey. And that's what most people do. They, they sell the process of getting there. They sell the, hey, we got ergonomic seats and uh, we got extra leg room and our peanuts are fancier than the other airlines and our, our flight attendants are just a little bit friendlier, right? And we don't, we don't charge you extra for the carry-on bag and bullshit like that. But all I want to know is, can you get me to where I'm fucking going? And so uh, your messaging, by the way, is entirely about your plane ride and your process to get them from A to B. And what you need to focus on is the A to B. Um, 
And so it's not about like, hey, authority area, and we're gonna update your LinkedIn profile and all those things. It's about like, we're gonna get you seller listings or buyer listings. And ideally I would focus on getting them seller or buyer listings of a very, or, or I guess buyers wouldn't be listings, but um, you know, seller listings or buyers and getting them of a specific type, right? Like if I was a real estate agent, personally, I'm not, but I'd be really interested in getting investors who like buy from me again and again and again and again and are not looking just for one investment property where they can fix and flip, but like hundreds of them where I could get like <clears throat> you know, a commission on them again and again and again and again. So, but you are in the, getting out of them out of the problems and chances are, um, and then one other piece that I want to give you, and I'll come back to that metaphor in a second, is... Uh, 95% of real estate agents would, are not worth your time as clients. I know it, it seems like you're trying really hard to prospect, but I would focus on the people who are actively spending money and ha are brokers of record, meaning they have agents who work under them. Because what will happen is it's such a low bar to get into. It's like life coaching. There's just way too many of them. And most agents, they're not going to make it with or without you. Like, uh, I don't know if any of you guys watch those shows like Kitchen Nightmares or Bar Rescue. But I, I saw a really interesting stat about Gordon Ramsay is that uh, he goes and fixes up these restaurants. And uh, I don't know if you guys know the stats of what the failure rates are, but uh, they're 95%, meaning they get the best chef in the world, the most famous one. They get all the benefits of publicity and still 19 out of 20 of them fail. And there's a simple lesson in that is you don't turn losers into winners. You help winners win more. So find their agents who are already the top sellers in the market, who are already doing the best and pitch that to them and then get away from pitching the process and start pitching the outcome of the process, which is I'm gonna get your listings, I'll get your buyers, I know how to use LinkedIn to to mine for clients or, or for, you know, <coughs> for deals or whatever, I'll bring you a deal using LinkedIn kind of thing and get away from that. And one thing that will really help you is if um, you uh, go on to, um, uh, what I mentioned earlier, the Beyond Agency Profits YouTube channel and type in unfair sales advantage. I can tell you with real estate agents, a lot of real estate agents complain that when they're successful, you're glued to your phone, right? Like every three minutes, there's somebody who needs information. And if you sleep on that, they, those deals won't close. So I would suggest to you a big part of their before problem is like, you're always on the phone, you're always texting and it's a lot of dead leads. I wanna show you how to use LinkedIn to, to get listings. <laughs> and I'll set up all the, the the details for you, but they're not buying the authority blueprint because all of that is plane ride. The last analogy I'll use to kind of make this point, what I call the hammer, you have to understand that our services are literally, if you get a hundred different clients, even though you're doing the same process, it's a hundred different things to a hundred different people, right? Everybody who comes into the hardware store to buy a hammer has a very different intention, right? Like one person, may want to build a birdhouse with their daughter and it's really the smiling daughter and the happy outcome that's what they're after another person may be trying to like uh build a new deck so they can have backyard um barbecues and things like that and another person may want to remodel the kitchen so they can entertain guests every single person who comes in there with a hammer is is like literally after something different and so what the, the worst thing you can do is sell the hammer and say, well, it's got ergonomic handle, handle and it's 1040 steel. So start, get away from selling your process and get into what it's going to do. And this is, this is the difference, okay? If I could summarize it in a sentence, you are describing what you are going to do. Describe what gets done, right? So like if I have a, I actually have a real life scenario, like we have a plumbing issue, like some of the toilets are flush and slow and it's making this glug, 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 glug sound. If I hire a plumber, I want to know that if I give you an hour and a hundred bucks, that problem will be gone. That's what I want to know. What I don't want to know is you're going to use your Serpent 9000 and a little bit of Drano and you're going to take out your tool and you and Giovanni are gonna have sweaty butt cracks in there. Like none of that shit I care about, right? And that's how most business owners are, especially the successful ones. So I'd say like, it's a twofold effect. Make sure you're talking to the right real estate agents, like the ones who spend all the money and are the top players. If they're not advertising now, I wouldn't talk to them and I wouldn't message them. And then focus on what gets done, not what it is you are going to do in that process. Um, 
Jake says, when you sell the outcome, how do you the expectation for how long it'll take if it's not immediate? I get a lot of new businesses that are hiring us to help them launch, but they never have la uh, lists to do database reactivations, which means it takes longer to start getting them leads through SEO and pay-per-click. Um, like, truth be told, uh, so this, this is kind of a deep question, Jake. Uh, you're, you're two for two on the deep questions. Um, basically, the longer your shit work takes to work, the more expectation setting you have to do. And so, like you mentioned, database reactivation. So I might run a database reactivation and the client gets results by like Friday. It's it's uh, Monday as I'm recording this. So like four days, you don't really need a lot of expectation setting. Like, hey, let's just run the campaign, see what happens. That might be the total extent of the expectations. If you're doing SEO and it might take them eight months to really see the phone ringing, then you have to set expectations over and over. And one of the things that will help you is to think about it as micro KPIs, right? Like, like you know, SEO has often been compared to a marathon. So if you think about it as a marathon, like, hey, I'm not going to take you 26 miles in the next five minutes, but I can bring you the first two and, or the first one maybe. And then, uh, and, and then we'll focus on getting to mile two and mile three. And, and you keep like setting those micro KPIs, like, hey, we're number 27 for this keyword. Next month, I wanna be 20, I wanna be 19. And you keep focusing on like those little wins building in the right direction, even though we know that's not a linear process. And then, um, but when you're selling like SEO, you have to basically keep setting expectations over and 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 over until it's so obvious your shit works, right? Like once they get a top three ranking and their phone is blowing up and people are saying, I found you on the Google, you don't really need to talk about shit all that much. Um, but when it's, um, um, when it's in that limbo phase, you got to, and, and so I just, I think expectations are five things like to simplify it, right? is the first is get clear on what result we're gonna actually get, right? And, and always, by the way, when you when you get clear on these things, like in specific, always under promise and over deliver. So like, I used to run a lot of Facebook ads. Like if I thought we could get them $10 leads, I'd tell them 20. And then I go, holy shit, they're coming in at 10. <coughs> <coughs> Which is what I expected the whole time. Um, <clears throat> second thing is, is you mentioned time. It's like, just be real with them, like, especially, if you're dealing with sophisticated business owners, like not like a beginner that's like sees marketing as like a casino, but somebody who's like been around 10 years, they tried lots of providers like you, you can just be real with those. A lot of times marketers think you have to come in with this like, I will make you $500,000 by midnight guaranteed or I will pay you $1,000 for wasting your fucking time. And they don't realize it's perfectly okay to say, hey, I've done this a lot of times. In your case, I think it'll take like six to nine months. I'm gonna update you continuously throughout that process. But are you prepared to go six to nine months? What I will show you is we're gonna keep moving forward in that marathon. But um, I just wanna be real with you. Like, you know, if, after three to four months, like if you're looking to pull the plug after three to four months, you'll have wasted not only your time, but my time because like we won't be there. We'll be 40%, 50% of the way finish the marathon, but we will not be in the lead in first place. And a lot of times they're like, hey man, that's cool right? Um, so that's the second thing. Then I, I think it's important to get on the same page about um, what it costs to actually do that. Uh, in your case, like this is what you're going to need to spend on pay-per-click. This is what you're going to need to spend on SEO, whatever. <clears throat> and then the communication, like how often are you going to touch base and what are you going to update them about? Like the more they know that in advance, hey, uh, every second Friday, we're going to send you a little report and it's going to cover these things. Like they'll be cooler. And then the last piece is what I need from you. It might be like somebody calls you, fucking answer that call within two minutes, right? Like, like you got two minutes to either answer it or call them back. Like that's the deal, right? Um, so like that's kind of the gist of it. But if you nail um, for a long deliverable like that, you have to become a master of setting expectations. The shorter your deliverable, you can actually almost do no expectation setting. But in your case, with that long kind of service, you just gotta like really spell it out and just be honest with my. I'm amazed at how many times we think we have to show up as the. I guarantee you will make five hundred thousand motherfucking dollars. I promise you, motherfucker. <coughs> Sorry, guys, got a little bit of a cold. It's the over and over part that kills me. Thinking about getting account manager to facilitate those constant touch points. We're starting to show results. But I get those ball busters who want to micromanage us because the phone didn't start blowing up month two. That I mean, that's just one of the challenges, to be honest with you, of dealing with SEO. There's always going to be that ball buster or two. Um, yes, you can put in an account manager. And if you guys are interested, 
I do have an outsource service that will bring in account managers for you and they're like pre-trained and all those things. They're they're probably a little more expensive than hiring your own VA, but not that much more expensive and they'll save you a lot of time, energy and headaches in that process. So I'll share some of those links with you guys if, if you're interested in that. But yes, I'm with you. Um, part of the reason, uh, Jake, I, I don't do SEO for people really anymore other than like I guess we have some white label partners is, is for what you described is because people just don't understand the process and then like they, they constantly fucking like want to, they, they, they exp- approach it with fear and uncertainty and doubt and they want you to, re- I call it reassure me. Almost all of the meetings in SEO are like reassure me we're going in the right direction. Reassure me this is working until the phone blows up and then you don't have to reassure them anymore. But, you know, like it's that middle lull of like two to four months where it's like, hey, like nothing obvious has happened. And and they all of a sudden have to double down in their trust in the process. I just like doing that shit for myself now. I don't like running it for clients for those reasons. But you absolutely can put in a client manager because, uh, you know, (laughs) somebody else would like talking about those challenges, especially if you train them correctly. Um, Nicola says, what channels are you guys using for outreach at at the moment? I'm going to give you the ultimate lawyer answer, which is ask a lawyer any question, by the way, and they'll tell you it depends. Here's what it depends on. A very simple variable called where the fuck is your market already? <laughs> um, where the fuck is your market already? Um, and, and that's a simple thing. Like if you're dealing with professional types, lawyers, doctors, accountants, those people are probably going to be on LinkedIn. You're dealing with a lot of other stuff. They may be on Facebook. You're dealing with what I call like redneck niches. <coughs> um, you know, work with my hands type, landscapers and those kind of people. Probably gonna have to meet them in real life. Like actually go to a meeting and shake hands with them and and those kind of things. So <coughs> it depends who you're trying to reach. Like if I was trying to reach an e-commerce Shopify owner, I would go to Facebook groups about Shopify. Amazing, right? So everybody kind of asks me what's the best channel for outreach and there is no one size blanket answer. It depends where your people already go there. <clears throat> and Jake says, I get a ton of, a lot of reassures me, trust me, bro. Unfortunately, it doesn't work on real estate professionals. I know. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's just the downside of SEO. It's a, it's a, everybody wants instant gratification and it's the ultimate delayed gratification thing. But when it works, it works really, really well. I've had it where uh, just my own personal properties, I've had uh, SEO send me 100,000 visitors a month on my own shit, not on client stuff. <coughs> I mean, how hard is it to make sales when Google sends you a free 100,000 visitors a month who are looking for the shit you do? Um, man, we got a, quite a few questions. I got. I guess I better speed up so I don't <laughs> leave you guys listen to me talk for two hours. Uh, Poole says, me last week. Does Frankie stuff really work? Sounds too good. Me, yes. Fuck yes. First pitch responded positively. Just completed video one of Frankie's Open With Anyone course. It's already working. Can't wait to see what else is in the course. Um, firstly, um, I just want to say <clears throat> congratulations to Pool. Like you're, you're actually taking action, which is the most important step. Um, you know, the, I have good information in there, but it's only as good as, as your ability to kind of apply it. And I'm, I'm working on making it simpler and easier. But I'll tell you why the shit works in very, very simple terms is the way most people approach strangers is essentially like if I could boil their shit down to a message, it's a generic copy and paste. Buy my shit, buy my shit, buy my shit. (coughs) And uh, one of the things that we do differently is I recognize that if you want to build relationships, especially at scale, you actually have to lead with value and you have to actually like contribute to other people. And so if you figure out how to make your first encounter a very personalized give instead of an ask, what you'll find is like most people, most doors open. And this this is, by the way, way beyond just agency stuff. So uh, I'm going to brag a little bit, but this is the honest to God's truth. Um, so I have hung at, uh, I hung, actually, I used to, I spent a year working for the Toronto Blue Jays, the baseball team. And I want to say like, uh, 2005, 2006, somewhere in there. I'm bad with dates, maybe 2004, um, somewhere in that range. I just, one season, I spent one season with the team. I was a low level usher, worked at the stadium. <coughs> but in that time, I got to hang and have like very, very cool interactions with many, many athletes. And I actually got to party with David Ortiz <coughs> uh, for one night. And um, let me just get a drink of water here. 
Big Poppy when he was in the, the height of his prime. And a big part of that was like using the opening skills. And I've also like been at major like <coughs> um, Hollywood celebrity parties. I went to one where Ashton Kutcher was there, Jack Canfield, Chicken Soup for the Soul. There were a bunch of athletes. I didn't know who they were, but they were kind of famous. And a lot of that <coughs> comes down to knowing how to open. <coughs> Ooh. And uh, the biggest thing I'll say is that great closers, everybody thinks they want a great closer, but great closers work for people who know how to open. And I, I'll use a cheesing dating analogy <coughs> just to make this point. But imagine you had two guys whose goal was to get laid and one of them was a great closer, meaning if he got a date, it was like a done deal. They're going to go back to his place and they're going to get freaky deaky. Right. And then you have a guy who's a great opener and he's actually a poor closer, but he can just like talk to any girl uh, or, you know, if any guy over and over super easily. What you would find is that if you just average over time, the guy who's a great closer may get two opportunities and go two for two. And the guy who's a great opener may have thousands of opportunities and might only go a hundred for a thousand, but he would still like have. And so that's the, this, the key with opening is that if you know how to personalize and open with value, you literally have endless opportunities. So <coughs> for those of you guys who are interested in that, they, they, <coughs> we have our courses on our website at beyondagencyprofits.com. Man, I'm coughing today. I don't know what's up. Basil says, in the spirit of doing quality instead of quantity outreach, <coughs> has anybody here incorporated buyer in, uh, intent and motivation in their factors of choosing which prospects to go after? By which I mean, having an extra check mark in your list says that yes, this client is also in the market for, <coughs> has buyer intent for SEO, video services, chat bots, whatever it is you're selling, and not just paying for general marketing, a shoe buyer. <coughs> if so, how do you determine buyer intent beforehand? I've heard that Apollo is a buyer intent feature. Has anybody used it? I can't speak to Apollo, but I can, uh, but I can use the um, the the fact that oh so. So a lot of my stuff, just so you guys know, it came from the fact that uh, pre-COVID, I, I went to a lot of lawyer conferences and spoke in person a lot, and I would see the same lawyers, and I would watch them spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, and I'd meet with them, and they'd discuss everything in masterminds, and I got to see how they like really bought. <coughs> what I found is that the top lawyers literally buy everything, everything. They're, they're willing to try anything at least one time, and the shit that works, they'll pay for forever. TV, radio, billboards, SEO, pay-per-click, TikTok, Instagram, you name it, they're willing to buy it. Chat bots, all of those things. AI, if it works, they want it. <coughs> and so what I found is, um, I've used this analogy with books. So I don't know if you guys can see, but over here I got some books over my shoulder. Um, I, I, I asked this in the group one time, how many books do you own? And there wasn't one single person who said, I own a book. In fact, there was nobody who even said less than 10. <coughs> and the people who said, actually, there was one person who said less than 10 and said, oh, I like digital books and I own a bazillion digital books. And, uh, and interestingly enough, like I have family members that don't read. I'm sure some of you guys can relate to that. Like uh, my, my brother, for example, never read a book in his life, probably never will till the day he dies. Now, if I try and go and sell business books, if you pitch it to me as a prospect, if you can just convince me there's one good idea in that book, I'll buy your fucking book. Why? Because I am a buyer of business books. And I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate. I'm sure a lot of you guys are also habitual business book buyers. <coughs> and what's important to be, understand too is that will never be satiated. There will never be a point where I say, you know what? I own enough business books. Fuck it. I'm done. <coughs> Anytime there's a new good business book, I want it. Ah, uh, cough's getting to me a little bit today. Um, appreciate you saying that, Paul, and the great analogy, uh, closing with women. Um, <coughs> if you have an idea for a business book and you pitch it to my brother, I don't care what copy you use. I don't care what offers you use. I don't care what messaging you use. You are not selling a fucking book. And so this finding people who are actually spending <coughs> on Facebook and Google, which is easy to do because they have pixels installed on their website, and uh, <coughs> Coldlytics can do this for you. <coughs> oh. um, Coldlytics can do this for you. Um, will save you a massive amount of headaches because 
what will happen is you'll focus on the people who are habitual buyers of the things you sell. Sounds easy, but almost always, like I use the shoe buyer analogy because most people try and sell for need instead of sell for behavior of buying it. So it's like, if you try, if you have shoes for sale and you try and sell it to somebody barefoot, they clearly need shoes, but you'll get so much resistance about the idea of like, why do I need shoes? I don't wear shoes. I, my life is perfectly okay without shoes. If you sell for behavior, You'll talk to somebody who already owns 200 pairs of shoes, and there's always a reason why they need one more pair. Maybe like they still need <coughs> dance shoes, or they need one that matches a certain outfit, or hey, I don't have tennis shoes yet, or my basketball shoes are wearing out, I really want a new pair, right? So there's always a reason why they need more shoes. So are you gonna find specifically buyer intent for certain things? Probably, but if you just focus on finding buyers, you'll find <coughs> they're far more open to receiving it, that message, just like pitch me a book idea, I'm open to hearing it, pitch my brother, you're barking up Shit's Creek. And 80% of any given market, whether you go after brick and mortar <coughs> or online coaches or like uh, e-commerce stores, they don't buy shit. Like you're gonna try and sell to people who like don't buy and you're just gonna waste a lot of fucking time. So um, yes, <coughs> use Coldlytics, <coughs> find people who have pixels installed <coughs> and pixels mean they're spending money on ads. <laughs> Josh says, what's your favorite book that helps with mindset? My most uh, favorite practical book, it's a little bit woo-woo, but if you guys dig that kind of stuff, it's anything by Neville Goddard. Uh, just makes it like super simple to like create the kind of things that you want and uh, really about like getting them clear in your mind and doing that. So uh, I won't go into super detail, but you can find some of his free stuff on YouTube. If you're interested, check it out. And uh, he's like, uh, I don't know. My favorite, personally, all time. I'm not saying he'll be your favorite, but he's definitely mine. Joanna says, what is your best procedure to fire a difficult client? They always pay, but they're just high maintenance and too needy. Joanna, when you got a difficult client, um, and they're super high maintenance, and they micromanage you, and they want to talk about shit, and, like, they constantly need reassuring, and they, like, you know, like, they change the color purple to slightly different purple, and they're, like, they're just really high maintenance, and it's not fun to deal with them and you recognize you need to fire them, my favorite way of doing that <coughs> is with the George Costanza. I don't know if you guys ever like watched Seinfeld back in the day, but there's a uh, famous episode. You can watch it on YouTube. George goes to break up with this lady, Mora. And uh, when he does, he gives her the it's not you, it's me speech. I'm in a different place in my life. I'm changing. Nothing against you, but I'm going a different direction. And therefore... It's not you, it's me. I need to let you go. That is the best way to fire a needy client <coughs> because what you will want to say is you're paying pain in my ass. You barely pay any money. You drive me fucking crazy. You drive my staff crazy. I'm sick and tired of the emails, all the text. Like <coughs> if I work this out to an hourly wage, I'm getting paid like five bucks an hour to talk to you all these times and it's never good enough. It's never cheap enough. It's never fast enough. And you drive me fucking crazy with all your questions. But that will not win you favor. And, and often, like, I think it's important to protect your reputation. If you're going to be in an industry for a while, your name will get around and will they will have private conversations about you, like it or not. One of the worst things you can do is be an asshole to people you let go because they will talk to other people who may be your ideal clients. So I think it's important to leave on high terms. <coughs> it's not you, it's me. We're, we're going a different direction. We got new stuff and uh, we're bringing in new staff. We really want to focus on this niche. And uh, we're going after bigger clients and it wouldn't make sense. I think we would do a half rate job for you and I don't want to put that on you. And then always like recommend them somebody else who would want them. Often, by the way, you can get a referral fee from another agency. Say, hey, I got this client, this is them. For me, they're a little too high maintenance, but you may like that. If I send them to you, would you be open to paying me a fee? And almost always they're like, yeah, right? So you can, you can actually get paid for a client that's not even yours. Last question on the docket, which is good because I think my voice is like reaching its limit here. Uh, although I'm going to record a little content later, but I'm going to have a little break, have some drinks, take a little hot shower, clear my, clear myself up. Uh, Keisha says, hey guys, question. <coughs> if you're using LinkedIn as part of your marketing, how do you not come across as, as one who's not trying to sell? I'm asking because I get a ton of inboxes and I usually disregard them. And it dawned on me as I'm working on an inbound marketing strategy for LinkedIn. Thanks in advance. So here's the deal, okay? People look at it like selling is a bad thing, so I wanna just dispel that piece first. The reason why <coughs> selling has such an icky name 
is because like there's a huge percentage of our market. Um, there's a huge percentage in our market where they they sell low quality things. They have no plan to fulfill on those, and they make bigger and bigger promises and deliver less and less. And so, if you could really like quantify the value for <coughs> the the promises, it's all it's all empty bullshit. And so, selling is is bad if you're doing that. <coughs> but if you're actually selling something that it is worth it and is valuable and helps the right type of clients. Like you owe it to them to actually sell it to them, like for real, for real. So I just want to get that out of the way that it's not a bad thing to sell. And you'll know you have this right <coughs> when every time you sell something, it feels more like a give than a take, right? If, if it feels like you're taking somebody's money and it feels icky, then, then you need to rearrange your value proposition. But if you're doing it right, you'll think, shit, <coughs> for only 3K a month or whatever, they're getting all the... Sh- you know, extra value, like our winning ads or winning blah, 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 <coughs> or our great service and our customer service reps and blah, blah, blah. Like, so the, the most important person has to be clear to is you. Now, the second thing is everybody thinks because I'm the loom guy <coughs> that what I've told people to do is mass blast people and say, Hey, I'll send you a video. And that does work. And I used it for many years. But I, I've developed way levels of efficiency, way beyond just like mass copy and paste messages and hey i'll send you a video and i'm a bigger believer the longer i do this that use outreach to create one too many opportunities and so i have seven categories (coughs) of what i call shoe stores people who have all the buyers in your space already there's the expertise the coaches the consultants the masterminds there are the content curators the youtube channels the podcasts etc etc the community leaders (coughs) <coughs> usually on LinkedIn and Facebook. There are the industry associations. There are the software and the tools. There are the events, workshops, conferences. And then there are the people who sell other shit, SEO, pay-per-click, like competitors, if you will. Although I don't really consider them competitors personally. And what I do with messaging is not, hey, how can I message 12,000 people in my me- in my space badly? Is I focus on, <clears throat> who already has 12,000 people paying attention to him in my space? And how can I co-create something with them that puts me on their radar and therefore drives inbound to me? So for example, every industry you're in, there's a fucking podcast already where everybody listens to it. Like your job is not to try and message those 12,000 people. It's to try and message the podcast owner and get on the podcast and bring those people to you. There's a YouTube channel they're all following. Like <coughs> how can you do an interview or co-create something or do a free training? There's a mastermind where they're already meeting hundreds of them, spending tons of money. There's a conference where they get together. How can you speak on the stage at the conference? (coughs) So for me, when I use outreach, I send one to five messages every week. (coughs) And I send them to people in my space (coughs) that have all the buying audiences already. uh, A magic word called distribution. (coughs) And I focus on co-creating with those people. And what happens is it drives all the inbound. I don't, I never have to message anybody. You know, I send a couple of messages like, hey, I see you have the top mastermind. Hey, would your people be interested in something like this? I'd love to co-create something with you and create some value for these people. Would you be open to that? And they almost always say yes, by the way, because they need help with that. And what happens is it drives inbound to us and you never have to like sell the way like you know use car salesman way that that you're kind of like alluding to that everybody else does and what happens is you'll close tons of deals and that's where we actually insert the video when they say hey i'm interested in working together i'm like i don't like chase these people down i just send them a video and say um blah 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 and uh and uh, that's really it and then uh we keep it easy peasy from there right but um you know, I don't chase people around in their inbox. Like, I don't think you need to do that. I don't know why. I don't know why this is so taught. I think the reason <coughs> this is so popular in our space is because it's easy to wrap your head around. It's like I used to sell chocolate bars door to door. That's what this is. It's like what everybody's teaching is digital door knocking. Just knock on a billion doors. But there's way smarter ways of doing it and way more efficient ways. <coughs> like. Send one message to the conference owner and tell them you got a really cool idea and why they should have you speak on their stage. And by the way, if you do that well, if you know how to pitch people in that, you got a 50-50 chance of like actually being on their stage and they'll give you the audience for free. And (coughs) 
you might have like, you know, like in my case, like 3,500 lawyers all sitting there looking back at you speak on stage and you don't, you don't have to sell. You just walk off and five, 10, 15 of them want to buy your shit without even trying. And that's where I'd say, hey, we, I got more information for you. Can I send a video, a five minute loom video? And they'll close themselves, right? And there's nothing really to do. So I'm a bigger fan of that. And I think that's <coughs> what I want to bring to our space. And I'll tell you for me, um, I don't have the time and energy with three kids and multiple businesses to be chasing people in their fucking inbox and having <coughs> hundreds of conversations with people who don't even know who the fuck we are that are not really that interested and hey, jump on a call with anyone and everyone so that most of them can reject you and say like, no thanks and be kind of closed off because they're like three out of 10. Like, I know that's what's taught in our space, but I think that's a bunch of like inefficient horse shit and I would never encourage you guys to do that. I'm a bigger fan of <coughs> create for yourself one to many opportunities and then close the inbound. I think that's a much smarter way of doing it personally. And then and then when you have that stuff dialed in, like use paid ads to then amplify the shit that's working. So like for me, if I have a video of me on speaking on stage and I and I sign five, ten clients from that, like digitize that, turn that into a paid ad, turn that into an email list and use that asset more and more. So I hope that makes sense to you guys because I, I want to bring a different like <coughs> approach <coughs> to this space entirely of just like mass blast everybody who's not interested and in, in having to be like you know a, a spammer to get business and rather like bringing business to you like i don't work that hard for business i really don't like not for chasing people it comes to us and then we send them videos and they fucking close like that's really it <coughs> um but we we do a lot to like create those opportunities inbound like that's the whole point of outbound to me is to create inbound opportunities so yes, thanks Drew, I hope I feel better too. It's mostly because I don't, usually like in the past when I get a cold or whatever, it's over in a day, but with three kids, I never get enough rest, so it tends to drag out a little longer since I've had kids, but I'm cool, I'll be all right. I'm getting better. For those of you guys who missed the, the intro, um, we're doing some really cool shit in Mexico. I would love for you guys to come. Um, we are filling up, but there still are some spots. <coughs> and as I mentioned earlier, I'm working on book two. We figured out how to put together $500 to $5,000 a month passive automated recurring income. And there's there's literally <coughs> thousands of deals you can do like this. You set them up once, they run in the background, they keep paying you. And my favorite part of the whole thing is you do not leave, need a client. There is no fulfillment. There is nothing to do. There is nothing to deliver. And I would love to help you guys drive that as a, 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 an alternative to having to work so hard for clients. And it's using the skill set you already have, but in a different way. Um, and if you guys uh, come to Mexico, you guys are going to be the first ones to be able to build that before anyone else. I would love to actually sit with you in the event and build one of these streams because you can actually do it inside of an hour. It's actually mind blowing when you see this opportunity that nobody else sees. And uh, and for those of you guys who are interested, like come hang with me in person and we'll build some cool shit. And then I also have some other cool bonuses that I haven't announced yet, but um, that are going to be coming. Uh, Drew says, we got one more for the docket. It says, quick question based on you, what you just said. I'm selling the digital to the digital expertise niche. Do you think it's really worth narrowing down to specifically consultant or coaches or masterminds or keeping it open uh, when getting uh, started nailing down my offer? When following the $100 bill idea, helping to sell high ticket stuff. Truth is, Drew, um, there, there are a million ways to be unsuccessful at this business. And then there's like a thousand to be successful. So there's, there's not like one path. I hate when people are like, if you don't follow the Frankie Finn system, you're gonna be a fucking loser. Um, a lot of people are evangelists about their one way of do things, I'm not. Um, so having said that, it, it depends on what you want. Like it's your fucking business, right? Like if you want to work with, I personally would focus on masterminds because they've been very transformative for me. They're a product I believe in and they're a very high ticket thing. And even if you sell one mastermind for 40K, like it's very normal to flip you five or 10K kind of thing. And so like even if you just sell them one mastermind a month, like they'll happily pay you five or 10K for that. So for me, that's where I'd probably focus on. But like, I don't know, for you, it, it sounds like you're in a stage where it might make more sense to leave it more wide open, work with a few people and see what you like doing. So like both strategies can work. It's not an either or. I will tell you from a messaging standpoint, the more specific you are, the easier it'll be to get working faster. Right, like if I say, hey, do you have a 40K mastermind for coaches? <coughs> That's gonna be very specific. 
and uh, it's probably going to work better than like if I just randomly, you know, say, hey, if you have an expertise product to anyone, anywhere, I can help you, right? So um, specificity sells. So like I might try different angles of that, but like, you know, in the beginning, sometimes it just makes sense to work with people in different industries. I've done this before. Like we've been uh, not like completely all over the board, but I remember (coughs) we were running paid ads and we had money to burn. And so we were just like, hey, let's just try five different industries. And whichever one we like working with the most, that'll be our niche. But we didn't really know until we started it. And, uh, you know, like there can be reasons to do that. So I don't think there's like one single, you have to follow this fucking way or you'll be a loser. It's more about like, what do you want? And for me, I like selling really expensive things because it makes it really easy to move the needle. And, and you know, like, um, like I have a, a, a revenue share partner who sent me like, um, like 20 grand in the last 60 days. Um, nothing crazy, but like not nothing either, right? Like 20 grand is not nothing. And uh, I might have brought him like three or four people, right? Like we're not talking I saved his fucking life or anything like that. I brought him like a little tiny handful of people and those people were worth a lot to him. So he sent me a big fat um, referral kind of fee or affiliate commission or whatever you want to call it, like a percentage of the deal. So that's kind of like um how i look at that um but you know focus on selling the things you want to like this is the thing is like if money were removed from the equation and you didn't need clients and you didn't have bills to pay like who would you actually want to work with that's usually the best person to aim your shit at (coughs) because what i find is those are the clients you'll work the hardest for you'll do all the little things you care about they're easy to talk to they're the most fun to work with and a lot of times if you if you think about like i'm just trying to make money you'll 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 almost like forget about all those other things and those are actually the most important things because i tell you like in the agency space like this is the honest god's truth like one of the reasons i consider myself successful at this i know there's other people who do it and are successful too (coughs) but i legit love you guys i legit love hearing from you guys i love getting messages from you i love seeing what you guys are building i love the cool stuff i love talking to you guys i love seeing where you're at i love the problems i love the challenges i love all of it so like for me it's easy to grow this business because i'm like I don't wake up and think, ah, fuck, Drew's going to message me again today, right? Um, But I've had that in the past where I have had clients where it's like, ah, fuck, like plastic surgeons, I did well with them. I hated them. (laughs) I hated talking to them. Maybe a a lot of it because we talked about they were SEO style kind of reassure me meetings, but I did not have fun with those people. And so like it became hard to grow the business. Every day felt like pushing a boulder uphill. I did it and it was successful out of it. Man, it was fucking insane amounts of effort and (laughs) <laughs> an unfun grunt work effort as where like this kind of business like I could do this in my sleep like it's almost like if you just woke me up at three in the morning and said can you talk to us about Facebook ads I could do it so anyways I hope that's helpful to you brother because uh, you know like think think about what you want and then like it, it's it's more about you being the chooser you're, you're, you're not the chosen it's not about like which message would get me chosen it's about who do I really want and then writing messaging to be the chooser you know, it's like if you are a prom queen who shares all these values with me and wants to build this kind of life, then let's talk, right? It's like you're going after who you want, not, um, you know, just like hoping somebody specific will show up. Um, and then what was, oh, oh, there was one last thing I wanted to mention for those of you guys who missed the <coughs> beginning besides the uh, we're going to party in Mexico and it's going to be fucking awesome. Um, and we still got a few spots open. Um, but um is the second piece, which is uh, the wolf pack is just getting cooler. If you guys want to come work together, uh, uh, hand in hand and help, you know, build a couple of cool things. My favorite thing to help build for people, and I'll tell you, is getting away from this one to many grinding, chasing, blah, 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 to, to going after, hey, I just send a few messages. I create a few opportunities. I share some value with people. People come to me. I close them with video and making acquisition like just easier just fucking easier and like way less of a grind so you can actually focus on helping and fulfilling we have a lot of tools to help people with fulfillment um you know onboarding tools vas scripts systems processes and we do talk about all those things inside the mastermind but my favorite thing is just to make acquisition easy because once you figure that out you have a license to print money for the rest of your life and it's like it's a skill that can never be taken away from you and because it's like it's based on principles so like even if a loom video goes away tomorrow 
the sales process works on people and I could use it anywhere. So like if I had to do it face to face or over a podcast, it wouldn't matter because I could still show you guys how to do it. And that's what I love building for you guys is like creating acquisition systems that for life, nobody can take that away from you. So if you guys are interested in that, check out the Wolfpack. I put a link below for those of you guys on uh, watching the replay on YouTube. YouTube, you can go to beyondagencyprofits.com and then there's a link for the Wolfpack. So that's all I got for you guys. My throat probably needs a little rest. I'm going to go take a shower here. <coughs> much love and may the force be with you guys if you like this video you're also going to want to grab some free bonuses which you can get at our website beyond agency profits to make it easy for you i've put the links to it in the description of this video as well as pinned in the top comment and we've got a couple of awesome things this is what you'll get after you sign up you get some of our best training how we're closing clients over loom videos how we sometimes sign clients that is not a misprint for under five us dollars uh, how to demonstrate your value in like amazing ways, trainings, how to have your clients write the best copy of your life, how we're closing without phone calls, campaigns that we've generated for clients for, that have done over $100,000, as well as scripts you can use to get conversations going with clients in under 10 minutes. All you got to simply do is go there, enter your name and email address, and then this is what you'll see on the other side. So if that's interesting to you, make sure to click the links below and I will see you on the other side.